Welcome to the Linux Talk. My guest today is Craig Connolly. He's a lawyer and writer on politics, military affairs, and geopolitics, and he's based in Sydney, Australia. Gray advises on inter-alia energy uh, resources uh, and admiralty law, law, and has advised also the Australian government on national security matters. He previously served as a naval intelligence officer in the Royal Australian Navy. All of Gray's uh, opinions uh, in this uh, talk today are his own and not those of the Australian government. And as you can guess, we are going to discuss uh, today uh, the new Australian government, uh, its agenda, specifically the international agenda, Australia's role in the world and in um, uh, relevant geopolitical uh, constellations, partnerships and alliances, but also the big politics. Gray, it's great to welcome you back to my show. Welcome. Thank you, Valina, for having me. It is always wonderful to join you and uh, and also to be a participant in these great discussions. Now, you have been one of my first guests uh, in Valina's talk um, at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot has happened in the meantime. And one of uh, the changes, one of the shifts uh, is a political one, namely that you have a new government. Would you uh, guide us a little bit uh, um, around the uh, new political uh, changes uh, in your countries and uh, give us a wrap up of uh, what uh, this uh, government is about, uh, what kind of agenda it has. Uh, it's very fresh. Uh, the uh, parliamentary elections took place on May 21. Uh, and yet we have you have already a new government, a, a whole team with ministers and even first international visits. So tell us a little bit about it. Okay, so uh, Australia had recently a federal election for our national government, for our national parliament. Uh, there was a change of government. The more conservative coalition government lost office and the Social Democratic Party, the Australian Labor Party, won office. And uh, the new Prime Minister is Anthony Albanese. Um, he is, a, I think, a fairly traditional sort of Labor leader. Um, he's actually, ironically, from the left of his party, but really he's changed a lot from, say, the student firebrand he may have once been. And so he leads a fairly conventional Labor government. Um, I think the biggest change... Uh, that many people would have thought of uh, would be that there would be more change, say, in the climate change area and the like. But for a country like Australia, there is only so much we can do. We're obviously a massive exporter of uh, natural resources, particularly coal and particularly gas. And so Australia is not a country that really uh, is, is going to be overly focused more than it has to be on these issues, despite whatever we might say. Just by way of background, understanding Australia for most people who do not have a great grasp of Australia. And that is, obviously, we're a massive island at the bottom of the world. Australia is roughly the same size as the European Union. Um, in fact, in some areas, we're a little, probably a little bit bigger. Um, Sydney to Perth, so from our east coast to our west coast, is, is much further distant than, say, London to Moscow. So it's, we've got a massive country. We've also only got 26 million people and we're, we're dependent on how we make our living as a country on trade. Roughly 20% of all the goods and services that are produced in Australia are for export. And Australia has a $2 trillion economy, which is more or less the 12th or 13th, depending on how you calculate it, the 12th or 13th largest economy in the world. So that forces those realities, a large country, actually an enormous country, a, a continent to a nation is what we have. Uh, an enormous country with a smaller population, which is always going to be growing through migration, uh, an enormous country with a small population, we just have certain realities that are forced upon Australia. So even if we have a major election and there is a lot of drama attached, no Australian government, when it comes into office, whatever else it may say, can, can, have, can escape the sort of iron realities of Australia's geography, how we earn our living as a country, and, and our needs in terms of a, a country that is open to the world for trade, a country that can receive new migrants and, and integrate them into our society. We're a massive migration country. And, and how we can sort of ensure that we are part of a series of alliances uh, with our major security partners, uh, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, and the like. How we can, how we can do that in a, in a way that protects us, protects our sovereignty, and allows us to engage 
with the rest of the world and minimizes our vulnerabilities. And as we've learned, one actually, I think uh, the first job of the new prime minister was to visit Tokyo for uh, the meetings uh, of uh, the famous uh, quadrilateral format, the Quad, together with uh, his uh, counterparts from the United States, uh, Japan, and uh, uh, India. So uh, obviously, uh, one of the first important uh, jobs was also related to uh, geopolitics and uh, international and in global, actually, uh, competition um, ongoing for, as we uh, already covered last uh, time uh, for quite some time now. Now, what is the view of uh, this government uh, regarding, of course, the global power competition, regarding the um, emerging systemic rivalry between uh, United States and China? We will talk a little bit later also about Australia's, uh, of course, Australia's at at approach to China, but uh, how uh, was this um, uh, participation of Australia with the new government uh, uh, well perceived uh, at home? And what was, uh, you know, Prime Minister's role uh, in the Quad uh, format in Japan? Okay, I, I think it's important just to express, so Australia has certain traditional alliances. So Australia is part of obviously the Five Eyes relationship, the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada and New Zealand. And so basically that's the alliance we have. It's very close, intimate alliance. And it comes out of not just World War II, but World War I and the obvious affinity that, say, English-speaking countries have with each other. Um, there are also, though, other relationships we have. So Australia has a very good relationship with France. Um, it's better now with the government having with the last government having lost because of how they treated the French, just being frank here. Um, we have a good relationship, with, obviously, with Germany, Israel. We have very close relations with the Gulf states. Uh, the Gulf Kingdoms, uh, and we have an enduring presence there. Um, and so we have these sort of alliances as well that build on top of them. And Australia is a partner of NATO. Australia contributes to NATO. We contribute to NATO missions and like. The Quad is something different. The Quad is Australia, obviously, with the United States, but with Japan and India. Now, Japan is obviously uh, incredibly important to Australia. It's our second largest trading partner. Um, we're developing a strategic relationship. The a previous Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, tried to enter into a future submarine project with the Japanese. And so we've had a very close relationship with Japan for, for decades. And obviously with India, we've been desperately trying to build an ever closer relationship with India uh, for the last 20 years. Um, there were some bumpy areas um, in previous governments because they very much mishandled uh, the Indian relationship. But the last Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, I think did an excellent job of trying to nurture the Indian relationship. And I think the current government will, will build on that. I think there'll be much more continuity, I think, between the Morrison and Albanese governments, between the coalition and the Labor governments, I think, than changes in this area. I think, as I said before, there are just certain iron realities that impose themselves on Australia and whatever minor political squabbling there may be at a domestic level on foreign policy, defence and security and the like, the continuities are much greater and the commonalities are much greater because... We just simply have a strategic situation forced upon us by the reality of where we are and by the population we have and by the interests that we have as a open trading economy. And so those, those things just drive us as a country into ever close relations with, with Japan and with India. And, and we've also had very close relations, it shouldn't be ignored, with Singapore, South Korea. We have a good relationship with Indonesia. Um, now we again we've had I'm old enough that we had some bumps there, um, but we've had a, we have a good relationship with Indonesia, and so basically Australia is is in the friend the friend aggregation business if I can put that Australia always wants to have more friends, and again that's the function of having a massive country with a smaller population. You want to be in as many alliances and clubs as you can, and uh, you know Australia does have obviously the very close relationship in the in the Five Eyes with our traditional allies, but we also have. Other allies we build on, we, we help out in NATO missions. Australia has been a contributor to the Western support for Ukraine. Uh, and Australia, in a matter of days, managed to uh, refurbish, repaint and ship armoured fighting vehicles uh, to uh, assist the Ukrainians. Uh, because we, are, we consider ourselves to be a very good ally. We consider ourselves to be a reliable friend. And as a country that is a reliable friend that is able to do things, uh, we look for other reliable friends who can benefit us. And so we try to be that partner to other countries in the hope, obviously, of reciprocity that we will be able to build those kinds of relationships too. Um, and so that, that's also why, for instance, just to explain Australia, Australia, for instance, you know, we, we've, we've served with the British and the Americans in every war of the last 
hundred years. We obviously were in the Vietnam War, we're in both Gulf Wars, we're in Iraq, we're in Afghanistan. We are a supportive ally. Uh, we're a reliable ally. I think in my last discussion with you, I think I said to you, if when the chips were down and no one else was the friends of the Americans, we would be their friend. So were the British, so were the Canadians. We, because it is simply, a we're friends. We we have genuine commonalities with the Americans. We have a genuine relationship that goes back, you know, years. We have a great sentimental attachment to the Americans, uh, and so on. And they've been very good allies for us. And it would be in our interest to make sure that the Americans are never left so alone in the world. They pack up their bat and ball. To use a cricketing analogy, or a baseball analogy, but to use an analogy and and go home, because it's not in our interest for that to do. So we're a partner that prides itself on being able to do things. And we're a partner, obviously, that has a certain exposure uh, to vulnerability as a massive island continent at the bottom of the world, where we have to have allies and alliances who can help us uh, secure our approaches to our territory, both air and sea. We will, of course, uh, cover Russia's war against Ukraine a little bit later. But before that, I would like to uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, the current uh, partnerships uh, and alliances Australia has engaged with. And of course, you um, already alluded to it, namely the Anglosphere and uh, this kind of Anglosphere-led uh, uh, partnerships. And of course, at the core of it, we've also witnessed uh, the, um, uh, the, the emergence of a new security and defense uh, pact together with UK and United States, the AUKUS. Uh, but uh, at the very same time, of course, AUKUS uh, also resulted in a kind of a tension uh, with uh, some of uh, the transatlantic partners. And here, of course, uh, France was uh, the main, uh, let's say, victim of the emergence of this kind of Anglosphere uh, security alignment in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, because it was more or less left behind. Now, in fact, we've uh, seen that the Australia that Australia has announced uh, 555 uh, million settlement with France Naval Group, um, and is also uh, seeking a way uh, to, uh, in fact, uh, warm up the relations with France. Do you think that Australia will also now, with the new government, will also seek to uh, kind of uh, find a way uh, for France also to be part of uh, this important Indo-Pacific, uh, um, let's say, partnerships, uh, specifically in the field of security and defense, uh, instead of uh, further alienating it or, uh, well, deepening a cleavage between the Anglosphere and the continental European partners within the big transatlantic family? Right. Um, very big question. The the handling of what was our former future submarine project with the French, and I want to be careful what I say here because I'm just giving my personal opinion, um, it could have been handled much better. Um, Australia actually has a very good relationship normally with the French. I mean, the French are in New Caledonia. They're obviously very heavily involved in the Indian Ocean. Um, we, we usually have an extremely good relationship with the French. Uh, they're in Afghanistan as well. Um, the French helped us out in Timor in 1999. Um, the French are a very, very reliable ally when push comes to shove. They're hard negotiators. They're often very hard to deal with, but that's a purely professional matter. I mean, the French are fighting for their corner and we're fighting for ours. So, so we often have those perhaps, um, uh, we occasionally have abrasive instances, but, but, but generally speaking, we've had a very, very good relationship with the French. And it's very much in our interest to have the French in our region um, they're a very, very useful partner. As I said before, they're a very reliable partner um, when push comes to shove. And obviously the French have interests in, in the Middle East as well that overlap with ours. And so I, I think the new government will uh, build, will rebuild some of the French relationship and hopefully progress it further. Um, there is no contradiction for Australia between being a very good ally of our traditional, say, Anglosphere partners. And there's no contradiction with us and being very good allies with, say, the French or the Israelis, or the Germans, or the Poles, and so on. I mean, we we have you know, we have obviously you know, very close relations with a whole host of countries, and yeah, you know, the French are the are the you know the nuclear power in the European Union now that Britain has left, and so you know it's in our interest to have as many friends as we can. I think I think the whole big problem with the way we handled uh, a lot of those issues to do with uh, submarines and the like. Those are probably matters that are going to be the subject of books and analyses in years to come. 
I just think the best thing we can do is perhaps draw a line under that episode, learn some lessons from it, and and build a relationship based on the great common common interests that we have. And I think it's a I think it's a mark of the maturity. I think of the new government. I, I, I actually want to give them praise here. They I think handled uh, the the ending of the submarine problem. I think very well, and I think uh, Australia got out of that with a very good result. Um, I say that both as an Australian and as a lawyer and as someone who has some knowledge of these matters, I think the government got a very good result. And I think uh, we need to just draw a line under that and move on. I think the one thing that will be very interesting for us is the question of how we um, how we approach what is going to be a future security architecture with not just the Quad, but obviously the French will be involved, uh, Singapore, South Korea and our other allies and differing views that people may have. But again, it's in Australia's interest that we have as many people as possible who have an interest in a stable Indo-Pacific where there are rules of the game and where the global commons of the sea are open. I think that's something that we all share an interest in and I think it's something we should be focusing on. And I think it's something I'm sure the new government will, will focus on simply because we we simply have no alternative. I mean, Australia, as I just keep coming back, if you look at a map, we're a massive island at the bottom of the world. Uh, we are dependent on the rest of the world for trade. We import uh, our allies are somewhat, our, our closest allies are somewhat distant from us. You know, we, we start out uh, having the battle in front of us. And uh, as I always say to people, you know, often have with far, you know, people who are not Australian will often say to me, wherever I go in the world, I find Australians or I find Australians in strange parts of the world. It's because we're a nation of great travellers because you know, we're on the far side of the world and there's just there's a whole world out there on which we depend and on which we have to understand and engage with. We we sort of do not have the luxury as a country of isolationism. Um, it's true, we can feed ourselves, we can power ourselves. The Australian continent is blessed with natural resources. So we have all that. But as a country, realistically, isolationism isn't an option for us. So we have to engage with everyone. We have to be friends with everyone. And in the case of the French, we have to keep the, fr the friends that we have. And I will say as an Australian, particularly as there will be French people uh, watching this, I mean, the French are very good to us. I mean, the French have all our, a lot of our war debt are buried in France in the First World War. The French are very good. They tend to all those things. That's a very important thing to Australia. We're a young country. A lot of what we have as a national history goes back to those wars where we fought. The French take very good care of that. And I think that was one of the reasons why in Australia there was great disquiet with the rupture with France because um, so many Australians have relatives who are buried in France, who fought for France. And I think it was just a great mishandling of that. And I'm, I'm very, very praising of the current government that they drew a line under that. So I think that will be good. Yes, obviously, if we listen to the statements of uh, the new government, uh, it is uh, eager to, uh, in fact, improve the relations with France. And, uh, of course, that obviously means also with European partners. But there is also another interesting uh, development, and that is Biden's proposed new Asia Trade Pact. Basically, he revived Obama's uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, by engaging with uh, 13 members, including Australia, and that would account for 40% of uh, the global gross domestic product, uh, knowing that, of course, China has also introduced uh, uh, a competing uh, geoeconomic project with uh, Asian partners, uh, namely the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership. How do you uh, see this uh, context now with the new Asian threat uh, pact, uh, the, the way you described it, uh, the way you put it, Australia would be eager to join and uh, it has a lot to offer to its uh, regional partners and neighbours. Um, uh, do you think that this will be a successful formula? Because uh, we know very well that um, um, in two years from now, uh, things may look very differently and uh, the top of uh, the political uh, you know, system in the United States uh, there may be also a political shift. Uh, and then again, uh, or let's say once again, uh, this uh, proposal, this new Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, 2.0 may be uh, overruled once again. Yes, no, no, it's very, that's an excellent question you asked. In respect of the original Trans-Pacific Partnership, obviously Australia was in favour of it. Uh, Australia is one of the few countries in the world I think the United States runs a trade surplus with, um, or it has historically. So Australians are always eager to access the American market. And one thing Australians always ran into was a certain American reluctance to open their markets, particularly agriculture. So, so that is always the sticking point for us with America is 
is we have a very good security relationship, but on the economic front, the American farming lobby is extremely powerful. And it's the one lobby that even goodwill towards Australia can never quite overcome. And so I think any pact we have with the Americans of a trade relation, relationship nature is going to have interesting issues for domestic America because the farming lobby in America has just been so strong. Even all through the Cold War, it was an issue with the Americans about trying to get Australian agricultural exports into America and coming into the, the brute reality of American domestic politics. The other big problem is the fact that, um, I, and I'm not being partisan at all, but, but if Biden's coattails are not what they are and his approval rating is so low and his party gets absolutely wiped out in the November elections, then whatever he proposes he's going to have to get enormous amounts of Republican buy-in. And it's not the Republican Party of the Bush era. It's a, it's a much more realistic uh, America first uh, view of the world. And I'm not criticising it. If I was American, I would, I would have similar reservations about uh, being taken advantage of by the rest of the world because America literally could be an autarkic state if it chose to be so. It would be a great cost to itself, but it could actually do it. Um, so, so, you have to always temper any enthusiasm for anything on the trade relationship with the Americans with the reality that their domestic politics is unusually focused on the various lobbies with pool, not just big tech, but also farming. And so that would be something that Australia would be very, very interested in joining, but which Australia would have a significant degree of, not reservations, but a significant degree of scepticism that it could even pass the American Congress as it currently is. I mean, that is just the, the brute reality. Even when Obama was putting forth the Trans-Pacific Partnership in the last years of his presidency, and, and Obama was trying to make the case that it's very important that we all agree with this because then we'll have an economic alliance that's that, that parallels our security alliances. Even when Obama put no stark terms about the importance of having a rules-based Western trading system among allies, even when Obama put it like this, there was still no support in America for that, or very little. And, you know, Trump, Trump ran against that successfully. Bernie Sanders ran against that successfully. And so you just have this major problem of any sort of trade pact involving the Americans. However idealistic one wants to be about free trading, it just runs into the brutal reality of the American Congress and the fact that there is no lobby that I'm aware of that can withstand the American farming lobby. And it's something that Australians are very, very well aware of as a agricultural exporting country. Thank you. So let's move to the dragon bear. Let's uh, uh, now address first and foremost, of course, the elephant in the Indo-Pacific room and why all of these relevant uh, initiatives and partnerships, uh, uh, well, took place in first, you know, uh, or let's say happened in first place, uh, namely because of, uh, of China. So AUKUS, uh, Quad, uh, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 2.0, all of this in reality has been initiated mostly because of the growing role of uh, China in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Now, Australia in reality uh, was uh, the first country to show uh, the globe uh, what uh, the coupling uh, from China really means, right? I mean, starting with uh, the um, call of Australia for independent inquiry into the regions of COVID-19. It resulted in a kind of outrage uh, by China. And that, of course, led also to the retaliation uh, measures of uh, China launched against Australia. Now, meanwhile, in fact, I argue that Australia was one of the first relevant regional powers that, in fact, took uh, sides. It uh, sided with the United States and with the Anglosphere when it comes to security and uh, defense uh, issues, uh, namely in preparation of the, of, well, let's say for the rise of uh, China. So how do you uh, see now this uh, geopolitical context uh, from, of course, the prism of, uh, the, of Australia's uh, goals and uh, interests? Uh, um, I also want, of course, uh, to mention in this uh, connection uh, the um, growing diplomatic ambitions in the South Pacific. Uh, here, once again, uh, we've uh, observed interesting developments uh, 
Vietnam and Australia in reality sent already its foreign minister, uh, um, well, new foreign minister, Penny Wong to Samoa and Tonga. Um, uh, could you also put these uh, relevant developments into the context of uh, China's rise in the Indo-Pacific and specifically in the South Pacific? So, so st starting from the big picture, and then I'll just work down. So, yes, yep. Australia was Australia was literally the first country that I, I I think we predated even Trump's America to say we needed a full, open, and impartial inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. Um, Australia did that because we are a fundamentally uh, rule-following, uh, law-abiding country which believes that facts are facts, and we need to follow facts where they go. That obviously upset the Chinese, who are our number one trading partner, but nonetheless. We dug in our heels. None of that happened in isolation. We've had significant problems with uh, China um, and Chinese influence in Australia and as part of a subtext of, of bigger foreign influence problems that we've had. And we've, we've had legislation passed to counteract uh, foreign influence, foreign, foreign lobbying and the like, and, and the corrupting effects that foreign money, not, not just Chinese, but foreign, foreign influence can have on your domestic politics. And so Australia took that very, very seriously. Um, we were obviously attacked by the Chinese in the best traditions, I think, of a particular Australian approach to the world. We sort of did not engage with it. We sort of let a lot of it go. There's an Australian saying in cricket about letting balls go through to the keeper. We just we just didn't take a swing at it. And we just let it go. The Chinese sort of vented and I think had to get things off their chest. But nonetheless, I think we maintained a firm line without being dramatic. And that's to the credit of the previous government. I think the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, our former Prime Minister, I think he handled that quite well. Um, the problems we now have in the Pacific is that the Chinese obviously have been very active in the Pacific Islands to our to our north and northeast uh, in terms of trying to uh, carry influence with uh, countries there. Um, the Solomon Islands is obviously of great concern. The Solomon Islands sits directly on Australia's sea line of communications with the west coast of the United States. The Solomon Islands actually is a crucial, uh, a crucial set of islands that we fought through in the Second World War. And uh, the capital, Honiara, um, and and the Solomon Islands more generally is literally vital strategic ground for Australia. Um, even if the Solomon Islands wasn't a country and was just unoccupied, those those territories would be crucial to Australia because of where they are uh, astride Australia's sea line of communications to the United States. So um, the new government has taken, I think, very, very good steps to try and uh, rebuild Australia's position in the Pacific Islands and to make clear that we uh, see... Chinese influence growing there as a major problem and a major concern. And I think that I think the new government, and I think had the previous government been re-elected, they would have done the same thing. I think there's a strong belief that we have to secure our own backyard and we have to be very, very careful of Chinese influence there. Now, at the moment, um, it's still a bit sketchy about what the Chinese may plan to do uh, in any of these agreements with the Solomon Islands. Uh, and so I'm, I'm reluctant to sort of get into the forecasting business there. But I would say that obviously for Australia, it's of crucial concern if the Chinese are this close to us in the Solomon Islands. Um, to give a historical parallel, in the 1960s, one of the big problems that Australia had with Indonesia uh, during the confrontation period with Sukarno was the perception that Sukarno was very, very close to China. And that was in the 1960s. And, and so Australia has a long history of being very concerned what happens to our near north and uh, what happens basically in our backyard. And uh, I know that may sound to some people a little bit brutally realistic and almost, uh, but that's just the way we have to think about it because Australia relies very heavily on our security relationship with the United States. Um, anyone who would occupy, say, the Solomon Islands or indeed any of the Pacific Islands who is hostile to us would be a major, major problem for us. And so um, that is a major concern. Um, and again, uh, I think I think to some degree that would have happened anyway, even if we had not had the other issues with China. I think the Chinese have been looking to expand. Obviously, uh, they have their, um, their behaviours in the South China Sea, and I think the Chinese would be looking to expand anyway. Um, I think Australia, through vigorous diplomacy and engagement with our, uh, our island neighbours, uh, will be seeking to counteract that and to hopefully offer more uh, than, than we have in the past uh, by way also of having you know, uh, Pacific Islands populations being able to come to Australia on working visas and, and the like, and, and, and being able to make it, you know, the relationship really work for them. Um, I think perhaps there's a failure in, in Australia, and I think every government going back you know, 100 years is probably engaged in this, of simply seeing the Pacific Islands as our backyard and is not something that we really have to cultivate and work on, and the fact that we do. Um, we have to work on 
um, attracting uh, our neighbours to take our side and to be with us. This is also why, to go back to an earlier point, why the relationship with the French is so important. The French are in New Caledonia. It's very, very important to engage the French. They have, they have interests just like we do in the region. And, and it's one of those things where we work better when we work with partners and, and allies. And so, again, that's that idea of Australia. We're in the friend aggregation business. We always want to have more friends, more security partners. And, and, and what is your... And what is your assessment about uh, the... Sorry, I missed that last part. So um, I think I think if you're asking me about my assessment of uh, where this is going forward, I think it is that uh, Australia obviously will be trying to develop relations with um, the Pacific and in a broader sense, trying to bring that into a broader structure. I think you mentioned uh, earlier about the American strategy to reinvigorate the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think that is something we would be very interested in doing. Um, so I think that's something that's very, very important to us. And uh, I think it's something that we would be very, very concerned um, that, Uh, would be stymied. At the same time, as I said before, we would be very, very uh, aware that the relationship with the Americans and the American Congress is something that um, we have to be uh, very concerned about and, uh, and something that we have to also have a very, very uh, realistic opinion of. Okay. Okay, I'm ready to come back whenever you are. This is also interconnected. Uh, Any route will uh, afterward.
so, Gray, given this uh, current uh, developments in the uh, South China Sea, um, and obviously there is also a militarization of uh, the region and increasing military presence by China, what is your assessment about uh, the possible uh, a possible military attack on Taiwan? Do you see uh, this kind of uh, tensions uh, taking place before the Congress of the Communist Party, the very important one in the second half of the year, given even also Xi Jinping's goals to solidify his uh, political power. Um, and uh, linked to it, if uh, you actually do not foresee this kind of military, uh, uh, military attack on Taiwan in the short term, uh, what is your assessment on uh, the long term, of course? Okay. Um, I, how, do I, how do I express this in simple terms? I, an, a Chinese attack to retake Taiwan, actually not retake, to actually invade it. It was it was never part of the People's Republic of China. Um, a Chinese attack to invade Taiwan is always possible. I am a small H China hawk. I, I'm somewhat less worried, at least at the moment, at least at the moment, I'm somewhat less worried than, say, some other people. I think for China, invading Taiwan is an incredibly heavy lift. And I say this to people all the time. I wrote a long thread on Twitter about my views on China invading Taiwan. I think the best day for China invading ta Taiwan would actually be perhaps the first day. I think it would just get terrible, uh, terrible and terrible and more terrible for China um, after that. And I think the, the downsides for China of invading Taiwan are immense. I always say to people, put the Americans to one side temporarily. For Japan, this is an absolute red line move. I mean, Taiwan was a colony of Japan's um, the idea that, for instance, that Japan could be idle if China invaded Taiwan, I think, is a massive assumption, which I think is entirely unfounded. I think the Japanese would have to act. And I think any Chinese invading fleet trying to lodge in Taiwan and be sustained there would be would just be you know, destroyed over over periods of days um, by the Japanese and obviously the Americans as well. I mean, this is just my personal opinion, but I think the, the for the Chinese, there's just such enormous risks for the Chinese in invading Taiwan and seeking to sustain a lodgement there, that I, I've just I'm struggling to foresee this this scenario where for the Chinese this would be attractive at the moment. Now that's not to say it may this may not be different towards the end of the year, but the one thing every Chinese leader since Mao has had the concern about is that their military sometimes may have a mind of its own, and one of the great unknowns in Chinese history was the Lin Bao coup of 1971, when Bao was marshal, he was a former intimate of Mao's. And to this day, we really have no idea what happened in China. But one thing we do know as a result of what happened in China in 1971 with Marshal Lin Bao and his family dying in a mysterious plane crash in Mongolia, one thing we do know is that every Chinese leader since then has kept a very, very close eye on the PLA and the PLA leadership. I'm not entirely sure that the PLA is organized for a major war of conquest. I always remind people the last war the Chinese really fought was against Vietnam in 1979, and they ended up having to declare victory and go home. They got beaten that badly. So the Chinese really do not have a military that's 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 particularly battle ready. Um, I just think there's, there's a whole series of stages you would have to get through for a Chinese invasion, not only to be probable, but also for the Chinese themselves to see it having more advantages than not. And you know, for the Chinese, the casualty toll of any invasion would be enormous. Um, the Taiwanese would fight to the death. Um, and I'm just really not sure what China gets out of an invasion of Taiwan. It's just a, such a heavy lift. Um, you will find other people who may have a completely different opinion, but that's just my view. I just, I just think it would be an enormously difficult um, operation for the Chinese to maintain. Um, the Chinese air force is in no shape to, I think, to, to take on the Americans, the Japanese and the allies that Taiwan would inevitably have um, in, that, in that war. And so I just think the Chinese would perhaps take a step, step back and apply the balance of forces and look at what the correlation of forces is and perhaps decide there are other ways of securing that objective that do not involve war. And 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 really the Chinese could perhaps live with the status quo. Now I understand with Xi, he obviously sees uh, these uh, sorts of uh, milestones, you know, the reunification of the country, et cetera, as something that he wants to achieve for himself. But at the end of the day, however powerful he is, he is still one man in a party and PLA structure. And I think he himself would have to be aware that this is something upon which his leadership, I'm not going to say he would be, he would have any danger of being removed, but I'm just saying 
his leadership would already have questions over it, over the pandemic, over the death toll in China from the pandemic. I mean, Shanghai recently just completed another lockdown. I just, I just, I, I just do not see the evidence before me uh, that would suggest that China is imminently going to invade Taiwan. Now, it's always possible. I just do not think at the moment that it is probable. And so, I think the bigger problem with China is, uh, you know, the, the the regime rests on performance legitimacy, like all authoritarian regimes do. They have to provide ever ever rising living standards, and you know, for the Ch- for China, a country that cannot feed itself from within, it cannot power itself from within. It, China is an importer of food. It's an importer of energy. That again, going back to our discussion before about iron realities that impose themselves. If you have to import your food, you have to import your power. You cannot develop these things on your own. It really causes enormous problems for you if you're contemplating a war. Um, it's different from societies where you actually have your within your own society and within your own domestic industries the capacity to you know produce your own uh, your own energy needs and you also can you can grow your own food etc. You you have certain advantages that a country say that China does even for China for all its massive population it just has certain vulnerabilities particularly around food and power that I think that cause it to be less intimidating as a as a power, particularly military power, that it may first uh, appear. So that's just my view. But as I said, I I am a I'm a small H China hawk would be the best way I'd describe myself. You know, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a dove. I'm not any sort of naive person about the PRC. I'm just I'm just someone who's a little bit more realistic about what I think the Chinese could hope to achieve by an invasion. And I I just think it would be I think it would be terrible for China. I think they would they they would suffer a rout basically. Well, to wrap it up, uh, possible yet not probable. I think from a real politic uh, point of view, this is really uh, this really makes uh, sense. Uh, but if we look at uh, look back to Europe, uh, there there is another example of uh, of uh, something that uh, most uh, most experts and analysts thought to be uh, well possible yet not probable, and that was a uh, full-scale war uh, on Ukraine. What is your assessment on Russia's war against Ukraine? How do you assess uh, the whole uh, plan of the Russian president uh, regarding Ukraine? Uh, Now we are in the fourth month of the war. Okay. Um, Can I say, in my defense, I actually was one of the people who said Russia invading Ukraine was more probable than not. Now, I'm not going to say that I ever said it was certain. I always took it as... A 6139, I was more, I was thinking it was more probable than not. So I, I, I just didn't see the downside for Russia from doing it. And I know that sounds kind of callous, but you have to take a step back and see the world through your adversary's eyes. And I, I thought Russia was more likely to invade Ukraine than not, simply because the Russians had mustered so much force on the Ukrainian border. It seemed all very, very bit of a waste if it was just there as a show of force. Um, in terms of how the Russians are going in the war. Um, I perhaps have an unfashionable view. I think the Russians are doing about as well as they should be doing. The facts are the Russians are fighting the Ukrainians. They're not fighting people we fought in the last 20 years. The Ukrainians are extremely tough. They're the descendants of the Cossacks. If you actually look in militaries where people of Ukrainian descent uh, join, they tend to do very well. The Ukrainians are very, very good fighters. And so the Russians have invaded Ukraine. The Ukrainians have put up a stiff resistance, but the Russians are making slow and steady progress at achieving their goals. And I think the Russian goal is to is to occupy and then annex uh, the Donbass and 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 to further entrench their power in the, from the Crimea northwards. And I think the one concern I think everyone should have, and I, I have no fixed view on this, is if the Russians, as of today, seem to be pushing uh, closer to Mykolaiv, um, if they continue going towards the west and start to look at Odessa, then you have obviously the specter that what the Russian campaign plan really is a uh, Nova Russia. They want to have all of the, the Black Sea coast of Ukraine, and they want to link up with Transnistria, and they basically want to turn Ukraine into a rump state that will be little more than, say, a province, a large province of Poland. That's That seems to be what the Russian campaign plan is. And one of the reasons why um, I was perhaps so eager for this to be resolved through arbitration diplomacy is Russia, once it gets control of the Black Sea coast, Russia's already got the Azov coast. They've already taken Mariupol. They've already got the Azov the Azov coast, once they get the Black Sea coast, then it's a really big problem for, for those of us in the West because there is nothing to stop Russia from reaching out to Turkey and saying, between us, we can control the Black Sea and let's let's look at what deal we can do. And the facts are, with, the facts are control of the Black Sea 
um, I say this particularly as an Australian because one of our foundational sort of national stories is Gallipoli, which was actually um, the Allies in the First World War trying to force the the Dardanelles to to basically supply Russia through Crimea. I mean, the Black Sea is such a crucial part of the world, and it could potentially be a deal that appeals so much to Turkey, it takes them out of NATO. And so it's just, this was always a much bigger problem than it seems. I realise a lot of people who will be listening to us talk will be screaming about, you know, international invasion, you know, you cannot reward aggressors, et cetera, et cetera. I was not the one advocating policies that poached the bear. I was always a view that the Russians are in their domain, and I thought the best result for Ukraine was to be a buffer state that was not in NATO, but perhaps might have been in the European Union on terms that might have been advantageous to the Russians as a neighbouring state. As it is, uh, the Russians have invaded Ukraine. They're going to occupy it. The Russians are never going to give any of this territory up, and they're occupying very resource-rich parts of Ukraine, which Russia will exploit. And as I said, if I, 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 I'm not one of those people who thinks Russia's next move would, and, I, and this is just personally my opinion, I do not think Russia's next move is to go westwards. I, I, I don't think the Russians want to invade you know, the Baltic states or, I mean, I, the Russians would get creamed if they, I think they went to Poland. Um, I think the Poles would give them all the problems that Ukraine's currently giving them and then more so. I think the Russians' next move, if they have one, would be against Georgia. I think the Black Sea is what the Russians want. And, and if the Black Sea becomes a Russian lake, then we have major problems as, as West because uh, it, would, it would be something very, very problematic for Turkey. And so I, I'm not quite sure how, how that is solved, but I think the war was wholly avoidable. And I think the fact that we now have it and the Russians show no sign that they're going to be uh, stopping soon, I think that's something that's quite concerning. And I think for people who think that the Russians are running out of ammunition that they actually make, that they're running low on vehicles they make, you know, Russia is a garrison state. People need to get this, to get their heads around this. The Russians can probably keep this war going for a lot longer um, than, than, than we think, even on a best case scenario. And the Russians were never doing as badly as people were made out. And you saw the, had the foolish side of Americans who, who, you know, the American neoconservatives who seem to have learned nothing for the last 25 years, you know, believing in ridiculous stories of, you know, ghosts of Kiev and the like. It's almost like childlike and it's, um, it's infant, infantile, imagination versus the hard reality that Russia is a garrison state. Russia has fought, you know, off and on for the last 20 years against the Chechens. It's fought obviously um, in Syria. Um, and, you know, the Russians are very, very experienced at fighting. And the the sheer lack of reality of a lot of people in thinking the Russians were somehow going to be stopped or stopped simply is ridiculous. And at the same time, it's not in the West's interest for Ukraine to collapse. I mean, if, you know, it's, it's very much in the West's interest to keep Ukraine uh, as a functional state as much as it possibly can. Um, where we land uh, on this at the end of the day is something that's not entirely clear to me at the moment. I think the French, obviously, and the Germans are trying to bring some sort of peace to this. I saw, obviously, Macron and Schultz uh, were in Kiev today, um, or yesterday, and they're obviously trying to speak to Zelensky about his future. At the end of the day, Zelensky's future for Ukraine is in Europe. I mean, you know, the Anglosphere... We can have all the best intentions we can. We can supply arms. We can do all that. But at the end of the day, Ukraine's future is in Europe. And the French and the Germans have simply have much more heft there than we Anglophones do. And I think the Ukrainians are going to have to take a step back and wonder what they're going to do. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's June now. It's soon you're going to still have the approach of the European winter. And it's just it's impossible for me to believe the Germans are going to, uh, going to allow themselves to be held hostage as an energy matter to the Russians at the price of Ukraine, which most Germans, I think, like the French, were never hugely in favour of assisting into the European Union. So I just think this is a massively complex question. Um, it was a war that we should always have tried to avoid, um, particularly in circumstances where it's actually had d- dramatically problematic effects in the Western alliance as a whole. Put Ukraine to one side. I mean... Obviously, we talked about the quad earlier. Australia is very close to, to India. We have a very close relationship with the Indians. India has made it abundantly clear that their, neg- their relations with Russia are not up for discussion. The Saudis have very close relationships with the Russians. The Israelis have close relations with the Russians. You know, and I, I often say to people, among the Saudis and the Israelis, the Russians are considered reliable friends in, in a way that the Americans used to be, but they're not anymore. A lot of, in the Middle East, and if you spend any time working in the Middle East, a lot of people in the Middle East associate American policy with truly stupid things like the Arab Spring, the toppling of Gaddafi, the arming of 
uh, perhaps by accident, but the stupid the arming of jihadi groups in Syria to bring down Assad, you know, the absolute chaos that was sown there. And then to top it all off uh, under the last president before Trump, Obama, the attempt to negotiate the nuclear deal with Iran. I mean, the idea that somehow if you're Saudi Arabia or Israel, you're going to go out of your way to do favours for someone who is then trying to do a deal with your existential enemy, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so the Russian invasion complicated all this because the Western alliances uh, fractures were coming into plain view because for the Indi for India, for Saudi Arabia, for Israel, their relations with Russia are such that they are not going to lightly give them up. It doesn't mean that they're not sympathetic to the Ukrainians' plight, but Russia is important to them. And if you take the view from, say, from India, yeah, you have China next door, who you fought a war with in 1962 and who you've had unceasing problems with. Russia is a reliable ally. Russia is an ally that can, can lean on Beijing and speak to them for you. You, know, the, you, you just Why would you give that up? I mean, you, you're not in Ukraine. You know, if you're if you're in India, you've got 1.2 billion people. If you're Modi, you've got 1.2 billion people to look after. That's your concern. Your concern is not being well thought of um, by you know people on Twitter, you know, as an ally of of Ukraine. That's you don't care about that. You've got 1.2 billion people to look after, and and same for Saudi Arabia and same for Israel. And I think a lot of this, I think in some respects, the war in Ukraine is simply a symptom of other bigger problems, and that is the inability to think clearly about what we did in the last 20 years, the stupid things that we did, particularly not just invading Iraq, but staying in Afghanistan for as long as we did, and then the absolutely shambolic way in which we left. Um, I think there's just a broader subtext about thinking about the world. And as I said before, I think it was a very, very dumb move to not sit down with the Russians in the last few years and try and arbitrate some sort of relationship with the Russians that was going to get us out of this confrontation spiral. This, this stupid idea that is that is said about there's some problem with sitting down with your enemies, that's who you make peace with. You make peace with your enemies. You should be always be prepared to negotiate, I think, with anyone. Um, I think this idea, this sort of strange, almost religious idea, you do not sit down with people you disagree with, is is just madness. I think the, the whole Russia issue, particularly with regard to Ukraine and the Russian populations in Ukraine, that was the original casus belli, I think that should have been negotiated uh, out you know, years ago. But after 2014, there was this just this determination to, to almost have a new Cold War with the Russians in circumstances where the Russians always had this option. All that's happened in this year is the Russians exercised an option we always should have known that they had, which is they could simply invade the country and take what they wanted. And all that's happened now is that the Russians are, okay, yes, they're sanctioned by the West, but there are large parts of the world they're not sanctioned by and that the Russians can go about their business. I mean, the Russians, according to various reports, have made $100 billion um, in you know, oil and gas sales since the war began because the price of oil and gas has gone up because of sanctions. I mean, just the amount of damage we sort of have done to ourselves. I mean, the, uh, the fact that, for instance, in the Middle East, and obviously the French would be very well aware of this because France and Lebanon have very close relations uh, going back to you know, when, when you know, Lebanon was a mandate for the French. Um, and... Yeah, the, the Russia and Ukraine together account for something like 25 to 28 percent of global wheat exports. You know, Australia is a massive wheat exporter as well. But but you know, when Russia and Ukraine cannot export wheat, it's it's actually affects mostly places like Egypt, Lebanon, and the like, in which you know the, the rises in the price of bread and the inability to source food cheaply is one of the things that led to the Arab Spring. So you're literally playing with fire in letting this war get, even begin. And it was a problem that no one really wanted to discuss the opportunity costs of having just endless confrontation with the Russians. And your people are going to watch this and say, well, he's Australian, why does he care? Well, the reason why I care also is because obviously our concern is China and every, every moment that people are basically rehashing squabbles in Europe, it, it, takes, it takes eyes off the ball where we are. And so you know, Australia, for instance, you know, we're obviously trying to do what we can for Ukraine. We've supplied um, armoured vehicles to Ukraine and the like, and you know, we're, we're a good ally. But... I think on the whole, if we had our druthers, we would rather this war never took place because it's just silly. We should have negotiated. It should have gone off to a long arbitration so that also everyone could save face because they look, we can have a negotiation about this. The negotiation may take decades, but we can have a negotiation about this. The Russians feel like they've got progress being made. The Ukrainians feel like they can protect their position, etc. And instead, we just had a series of, I think, very, very mature responses to a very, very complex situation. And now we're in this, I think, disastrous situation. And to be frank, I, I, I do not have a clear picture of 
of how we get out of this. I think people thinking, though, that, uh, well, we're going to arm the Ukrainians and they're going to get victory. I think it's just, it's just ridiculous. They can, they can put up a very, very stout defence and we can, we can help them to put up the best defence they can and perhaps impose a cost on the Russians. But I'm not particularly optimistic that there is a cost the Russians will not pay, a realistic cost the Russians will not pay to get what they want, which I think increasingly must be the Nova, Nova Asia plan along the Black Sea coast. That, that's just my personal opinion. Well, Gray, and I have a final question that is very much related to your assessment on Russia's war against Ukraine, and that is that the war also amplified the bifurcation of the global system, the splitting of the system of global affairs in two major, uh, in two major parts, uh, this kind of uh, manifestation of a, of, a, of a global conflict uh, between two systems, one being open, obviously, the uh, centered around the transatlantic community, and then, of course, one... Uh, uh, well, another one being, uh, you know, closed system between more authoritarian, authoritarian more uh, um, um, well, uh, closely governed uh, uh, states. Uh, so, uh, how do you foresee the further uh, relationship between China and Russia following uh, the, the the war against Ukraine? Um, do you think that uh, these two countries will further coordinate, uh, given the, uh, of course, the competition between China and United States? Or, um, I mean. For China, obviously, the the war was uh, not, uh, you know, take uh, now. Given that uh, Chinese president is uh, seeking for, uh, you know, to be to be uh, basically elected for life. Uh, this uh, relationship uh, uh, following uh, the war. Okay, um, I share your reservations about exactly that bifurcation. I think very much the, the last few months just solidifies not just the dragon bear between China and Russia, but also for a country like Iran as well and other members, say, of that Shanghai uh, cooperative. I think, the, I think the great concern from our perspective um, is that, um, I mean, and we, we obviously have this concern you know, not just as Australia with views on the United Nations, but we're also we're a supporter of um, Gulf allies and the like, that for, for someone like Iran, particularly, seeing Russia doing what it's doing, you know, China, you know, Russia is obviously a garrison state, so to a large degree is Iran. Iran can do a lot of the things in terms of self-sustainment. You know, Iran fought in the Iran-Iraq war, you know, which is 40 years ago, um, by, by dint of being able to produce a lot of its own munitions. It also has obviously a close relationship with North Korea. Um, and yeah, which complicates everything. Um, the facts are when you're talking about weapons in Iran, you're talking about weapons in North Korea because North Korea is Iran's weapons lab. And so, uh, you know, there is that problematic system. There's a problem of the Eurasian landmass. And, uh, you know, the one, one, I mean, to go back to something we discussed before, one of the few arguments for staying in Afghanistan, for instance, was the control, for instance, of the Bagram airfield. And Bagram was a massive base, it was a former Soviet base in Afghanistan. It literally is close to China, it's close to Iran, it's close to Russia. Strategically, it literally could be like your footprint there as an ally. No one ever, ever made the case for actually, we stay in Afghanistan, we prop up a friendly rela uh, friendly regime there, and we hold on to Bagram. No one wanted to have that argument because it almost sounded too obviously intelligent, I think, and also too obviously military focused. But the problem is, when we left Afghanistan in the shambolic way we did, we also abandoned Bagram. We abandoned all the sort of things that we actually had built there as facilities. And so we basically then retreated further south. And um, it's why India is just so important. I mean, India is so important to us now, even more so a year later after the collapse in Afghanistan. And so in relation to that future, obviously China and Russia are just going to support each other. This has solidified that relationship. The idea that, say, some conservative realists had that actually they could detach Russia from China and Iran, um, and which is certainly something I, I've thought of in the past. So I'm, I'm increasingly pessimistic we can ever do that. Um, we're just going to be facing this problem, I think, at least for the next decade, of Russia and China being close together. I mean, one of the biggest problems whenever you talk about Russia is you, you always have to be realistic. We are never going to have, even in the best of times, a close relationship with Russia. Russia is an, a difficult country for those of us in the West to get along with. We just simply have too many areas where we 
butt heads with the Russians. But the one big problem we do have with Russia, and, I, and I've tried stressing this to other people, is something Putin said. And I, I'm not a great believer in looking at everything through the, the prism of Putin, because I think if Putin disappeared tomorrow, the Russian leader that replaces him would have almost exactly the same policies as Putin. I think any leader of Russia would pursue the same policies of Putin, and perhaps a replacement leader may do it more competently. But something that Putin said that I think is very, very important, he said, Russia would be the friend of anyone who wants to be the friend of Russia. Now, I know that sounds kind of simplistic to people, but what that means is Russia is basically a transactional ally, and as long as you're a good partner, Russia will help you. Now, the big problem we have as a West, where we're trying to be all principles-based and rules-based, we, for a lot of regimes, we cannot compete with that. A lot of regimes want to hear someone, as powerful as the Russians are, say, we will be the friends of whoever wants to be our friend. You know, we tend to run the ruler over people and we tend to want to check them. They're rule of law people. You know, they've got rights for this people or that people and the like. Russians aren't like that. The Chinese aren't like that. And I think the biggest problem that we have, uh, to, to answer your question in a more complete way, is we just have no idea how to compete diplomatically and geopolitically with people who do not think the way we do. Earlier generations of Westerners did. Like you had, you had earlier generations of Westerners, often they had worked overseas, um, they, had, they had worked in areas where they were exposed to the rest of the world, and they had a sl slightly realistic point of view. Um, we, unfortunately, in the West have some of the worst elites I think we've ever had in our history, and I think they're just temperamentally unsuited to dealing with the world that, that we have in front of us. And I think it's something that I find, I find genuinely concerning because I think, um, I, I think the one thing that this has just shown is the complete failure to understand an adversary in the case of the Russians. I have no, I have no confidence it was any different uh, when Obama was negotiating with the Iranians and you know, the, the US government was sending pallets of US dollars in cash to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. I mean, just the, the complete lack of real, reality and realism in how you deal with the world and understanding how that world operates. And um, yeah, even to the micro, even at the micro level, you know, often you'll see discussions, for instance, about the inability of people to understand basics of sea power, the importance of you know, international merchant marines and the like, just in control of the seas. Yeah, you know, we spent 20 years you know, trying to remediate the Middle East in a completely futile attempt. We spent 20 years doing that when, in fact, what we should have been doing is making sure that you know, uh, you know, we were not you were not expending armies in the Middle East, but we were building up navies because control of the seas is everything. Now, perhaps that's something that I would say, but I think it is something that is going to come home to roost in the next decades, is that we've not invested enough in our ports, in our ships, in our shipping. And I think that's something as a West we're going to have to do, because in that bifurcated system, the sea is going to be what knits us all in the West together. And so I think uh, there'll be a greater emphasis on the importance of sea power, the importance of allies and allied navies and allied merchant marines even uh, working ever closer together to basically combat that sort of Eurasian entente uh, between the Russians, the Chinese and the Iranians that I think we're going to be confronted with. And I think that also means we have to be very realistic in how we deal with people we want to be our friends, like the Saudis, like the Emiratis, like the Indians and so on. Well, I think uh, you wrap it up uh, perfectly, and uh, specifically with this Eurasian on Pont, uh, I've been uh, I've been saying uh, again and again that the Dragon Bear is nothing more than just a tactical asymmetric modus vivendi of uh, coordination to, on the one side, create counterweight, credible counterweight to uh, U.S. global power projection, but on the other side, as you said, to also engage with uh, Eurasian powers, with other regional actors, uh, but it's not an alliance, it's not an entente, uh, and in a sense, this Eurasian entente is probably one of the buzzwords that we've been uh, discussing, I'm afraid, uh, in a year from now, if we come back to uh, our conversations from 2022. Uh, do you have a final uh there has been a question in the youtube chat once again on your assessment for the future of AUKUS. maybe to final as a final uh question uh, to you what is your anticipation for what comes next uh, what would be let's say uh the main development uh, or the main issues regarding AUKUS, quad uh, the indo-pacific uh, of course now in the short term 2022 2024 uh, you've mentioned already midterm elections coming, then maybe in 2024 uh, we, ha we will end up with a new uh, Republican uh, president. 
we may, we may not. But uh, what would be your, let's say, final uh, assessment or, or anticipation for uh, the um, uh, Anglo-Sphere uh, bloc uh, engaging with uh, relevant regional powers like Australia, but also trying to uh, build up uh, now synergy effects and, uh, you know, um, create a counterweight to the dragon bear? Okay, um, my, my final prediction, okay, um, and particularly as the spokesperson for the Anglosphere, um, I, I think AUKUS will just grow to be more a more and more close relationship and it will probably not be based just on submarines. I think there would be hopes that, say, Canada might want to join, perhaps not under Trudeau, but a future Canadian government might want to join. Um, I think in terms of the alliances more generally, I think relations obviously with the French become, I think will become closer. Obviously with the Quad, with, obviously with the Quad with uh, Japan, and with India, that will only deepen further. I think I think these are things that will be impervious, even even say to a a future in, you know, Republican president. You know, I think even if Trump was Trump came back, I think I don't think Trump would tamper with this. I don't think the people around Trump would tamper with this. So I think those are things that were just going to happen anyway. I think my one I'm not going to make a prediction, but I think my one big problem is I just do not see I do not see how the Russian invasion of Ukraine ends in a way that leaves the West in any kind of good situation. The, the turning of the Black Sea into a Russian and Turkish lake is something that does concern me. And I, I think people need to sit down and look at a map and think to themselves, if, if Russia can broker, in effect, a good relationship between Iran and Turkey, what that could mean. And I think that's something that should concern everyone. And I think there's been you know, some mishandling in our relationship with the Turks, um, you know, the Turks could have been handled better. I think giving the Turks lectures every five minutes about human rights or this kind of other thing, at the end of the day, you know, I, I find it incredibly strange, the need in the West, perhaps it's some sort of deep-seated intellectual Calvinism, but there's just this desperate need to give lectures to people. And I think giving lectures particularly to the Turks or giving lectures to other allies, you know, giving lectures to, say, India or Saudi Arabia, about how they should feel about certain things when it's clearly not in their interest to see things our way. I think that's incredibly counterproductive and it's something I would like to see end as soon as possible. If you have issues with a, with a friend, even in like normal personal life, these are best ventilated one-to-one -one in, sort of, in a sort of amicable way between friends. Instead, there's just this continuance of a sort of megaphone diplomacy, which is it's almost like people still think it's the 1990s. And it's, it's, it's very, very strange. So if, if you're old enough to remember the 1990s, there was a strong belief in globalisation, in human rights, in all these kinds of things, taking the world by storm. I mean, they were ridiculous at the time, but people did believe them. And I, I just find it strange that there's almost an, intense, an intent to alienate people at times when we should be trying to make friends. And my great concern, as I said, you know, at the micro level, if Russia has continued the invasion of Ukraine, the Russians take uh, the Black you know, the Black Sea port of Odessa and they can push on to Novorossiya, which you know, may seem a very big thing to think about, but it, at the moment, it's the only thing I can think the reason why the Russians are continuing the war. Then we have the problem of the Turks. Well, why, why, why would you stay in NATO? The Russians have taken over parts of the Black Sea. You know, if you're Turkish, the Russians maybe they give you a good deal. And you may think, actually, we, our future is better in having a deconflicted relationship with Iran and, and, and we get on. Now, how would that affect Israel? How would that affect Saudi Arabia? It's a big thing. I mean, this is, this is just the big problem of, the Russian, of, of, of things getting to the point where the Russians invaded Ukraine, is that once that happened, you know, wars, once they start, take on a life of their own. And, and countries that engage in war have to have benefits from the war to sell to their domestic population. In other words, whatever you thought you were going into the war for, the longer it goes on, the longer you have to be able to tell a story to your own people. This is why we went to the war and this is what we got out of it. And so for the Russians, the longer this war goes, the more it definitely has to turn into a, a war of annexation. It just does because you know, the, Russian, the Russian people have to get something from this that's beneficial. And I just think that we're just unprepared for what comes after that. And I think it's less that you know, this therefore means that you know, China would be more likely to invade Taiwan. I think the Chinese will make their own assessment based on the correlation of forces and their own likelihood of success. I, I think that's separate from that. It's just that world where the Russians feel, feel that the, you know, the annexation of a neighbouring country, circumstances where they think they have justification, but also they have, real, um, they have real benefits to gain from it. I think that is just something we're not necessarily mentally prepared for. 
And I, I think it's an even bigger problem for the West insofar as, you know, the Germans and the French anyway do not really seem to see that as a big problem. But for us, um, and perhaps there's a very Anglophonic view of the world, for us it's a big problem because if the if the Russians can close off parts of the Black Sea and they can encourage the Turks to see uh, the future of the Black Sea through, you know, eyes similar to Moscow's, then obviously that is just a massive problem because, you know, a world in which Russia, Turkey and Iran are sort of amicably, you know, carving up large chunks of the world together, particularly the most resource rich parts of the world, that's something that should concern everyone. And again, it's that point about being geopolitically aware and being realistic about what is happening. Um, and so I'm not going to make a prediction. I'm just going to hope that that people wisen up and they and they realise, as the, as the Jesuits taught some of us, that prudence is the highest virtue and uh, you need to think realistically and sensibly about the world. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this was Gray Connolly. You can find uh, Gray on Twitter, where he is regularly commenting uh, on relevant geopolitical um, developments and issues under Gray Connolly. And this uh, podcast episode was uh, possible with the kind support of Bharat Vart, uh, India's leading uh, podcast producer on politics, policy, and society. Gray, thank you very much for being with me and uh, for your excellent uh, insights and uh, comments uh, for your um, well forecast, uh, also your assessment on what may happen. And I'm pretty much on the same page, I must say, uh, when it comes to the realpolitik assessment that we are unfortunately... Uh, um, well approaching a kind of phase in the international relations where it's going to be once again about 19th century like uh, a global concert of powers this time because of the interconnected world we live uh, in and that would mean a lot of of course a lot of uh, tensions a lot of uh, proxy wars a lot of also rapprochements uh, based on uh, different uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic interests so uh, of course on the side of the west uh, there is is also a um, uh, uh, need for more flexibility to be more open to the, of course, to the needs and uh, interests. And of course, uh, they are never, they have never been national, let's say, they have never been um, eternal interest, uh, internal friends or eternal enemies, only eternal interests, right? Correct. That's um, correct. I mean, that's, that's the great British aphorism of the 19th century. But also the fact that, uh, as Mackinder talked about, so Halford Mackinder also, uh, who was British, talked about just the importance of the Eurasian landmass and the world island. And I think, I think just reality is just imposing itself upon us. I think for a few decades, perhaps we had a holiday from that at the end of the Cold War, and I think that's just all coming back now. To the extent it ever went away, it is coming back now. And I think those who approach the world with a sober and sensible view of the world, particularly with a view towards history and geography and and the populations at play and their their national experiences and why they matter um, I think that then enables you to understand better uh, the wars that are fought the struggles that are engaged in the grievances that are vented and uh, and how best you can res resolve these short of war and I, I always say to people you know, you have to be able to you have to be able to see to, to, to round this out by quoting from the great British uh, historian Sir Basil Liddell Hart you have to be able to put yourself in your adversary's position, see things from his point of view and avoid self-righteousness like the plague. And I think people who do that, I think, will have a much better way uh, of navigating what's coming in, as you say, this new phase that we are in, because I definitely agree with you that we're in it. So thank you very much for having me. I very much enjoyed this discussion and uh, I look forward to our next one. Thank you, Gray. It's been great pleasure. And uh, well, uh, this uh, conversation will be available on all channels on Paratvata, as I said, our uh, podcast producer of, of this episode and of many, many more. And if you're interested in the work and uh, the uh, comments of uh, Gray, you can find him on Twitter. Thank you. Stay with us and stay safe and sound. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharatvarta podcast. If you want to see more content like this, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We started Bharatvarta to facilitate long-form discussions on politics, policy, and culture. 
We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Bharatvartha on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You could also get in touch with us on our website www.bharatvartha.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care, and jai.